Well, I'm not talking. Who is sitting next to me? It's Kate Morton, but who is it? Who is she? This is the simplest question I can ask. That is the most complex question you could ask, and you <laughs> know it. <laughs> How does a person define themselves simply? A person is so multifaceted. Um, you know, I am a writer, wife, mother, many, many other things to many people. When did you discover the love for books? When did you discover that you love books? Very, very early. Um, I discovered that I loved books, and I'm glad you said that, because it, to me it's separate from a love of writing, which came a lot later. For me, I w it was before I could read for myself, when I was read to as a child, and then I, my, I was the first of three daughters in my parents' family, and my they were very keen that I should learn to read. So when I was about three or four years old, they would label everything in the house. So I learned to read very, very early. And from that moment, the first moment, I could realize that those black marks on a white page were more than that, that they actually, once you knew how to read them, were doorways into other worlds. That was it. I was hooked. That leads me to a question I wanted to ask later, but it's a good moment because in an interview I read, what do you think your readers should feel if they have finished the book? But you don't think of that because you are feeling something. You are in that world that you're reading before. And I know it from musicians, they do what they love to do and they don't think about the audience. Of the books. Yeah, that's true. It, it's, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's a very interesting... Um, Uh, transaction isn't the right word, but it takes two. Uh, for me, I can write a book, and a book for me becomes a time capsule of my life when I write it, and everything I see and think and feel and do in the year in which it takes to write the book finds its way in. It might not be overt, and I might be the only person who can see it, but it all finds a way in because it, that's the way I filter my experience of the world. But then when I finish and somebody else uh, picks up the book and starts to read it, they don't see my experience, but they bring their own to their interpretation of the book. And I just think that's such, a, such an intimate thing that it, their version of the book that they read is informed by their own life experience that they bring to it. I jump back, but later I come back to this point. I hope I won't forget <laughs> it. It's a bit complicated, but it just was the right moment for that. I was asking, when did you discover your love for books, and when did you discover your love for England, especially for Cromwell? Yes, it's, again, that's one of those uh, things I think I discovered very early. And the reason, I, I grew up in Australia, I'm Australian, and um, but Australia um, is part of the British Commonwealth, and particularly, uh, less so now, but when I was growing up, many of the books I read were set in England, so even though uh, I would have Christmas in the hot summer, I would still read about um, snow and meadows and words like conquer. We didn't have any conkers growing on the trees and falling to the ground, but they became almost uh, like Wonderland, this this uh, place that was far away and full of you know snow and squirrels and things we didn't see in our subtropical home. So it became um, a special other place. And then when I first visited, when I was uh, 17, it was like going somewhere I already knew. It was like somehow I'd, um, I had somehow laid down memories almost of a place I'd never been before. And uh, can I just tell you, I read something interesting recently. Scientists did a study where they uh, 
studied the brains of people reading and they found that when people read, say if you read about running, the part of your brain that's reading lights up, but also the part of your brain that would light up if you were running lights up. And through this study, they proved that by reading, you can actually trick your brain into believing that you are doing. And I just thought that was incredible, you know, that it's that powerful. You know, they say reading builds empathy, and, and I think it does. You experience things you've never actually done before. I would love to dis discuss about that because our brain is so wonderful. Really good uh, piano players, they, if they don't have a piano, they're exercising, practicing in their brain to just imagine and, and it yes, works out. Yes, it's true. Yeah, and the brain can do s such wonderful things. If I listen to you, there was a kind of magic about England. And it's very interesting that the magic touch that you haven't been disappointed. I know, you would expect that, wouldn't you? But the, the opposite is true. In fact, the, I, you know, I live in London now and I love it even more uh, in its reality because it's not uh, simply the romanticized version of my childhood that I love. I, I love it all the more for its um, fusion of, of past and present and tradition and progress and all these things clashing together make it so vibrant and, and alive and I really love that. Do you have to pinch yourself sometimes? You started writing and now you're living a dream and you're living in a dream. It sounds like that. And I'm sitting next to you and I can see how you start to lighten up if you talk about the things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I never take it for granted. I always feel very, very lucky. I get to do what I love. Um, and I mean, the writing, of course, and, and being read because that is... Um, it. it I, I wouldn't need to have millions of readers, but even just to have one person who takes something, as, because it's storytelling, isn't it? And to tell a story, you need someone to, to tell it to. It, it just, it brings the story, that, that joy of having told someone, you know, I'm going to tell you this story, the most amazing thing happened. And there's that connection with somebody else. And, you know, I, I really love that. It's quite separate to the... Um, the fulfillment of, of and the action and process of writing but it's it's just an additional um, element which is also um, very um, rewarding now the writer was talking the, the part or the part of you that is the writer but you you have been standing on, on a stage and you know a bit of literature so you have to do what you love and uh, if other people love it it's, it's even much better it feels much better but i think it's like being on a stage absolutely yes and you're right i i love the theater that was my first love i would i would have to say before i even thought about trying to write i wanted to be an, an actor on the stage but unfortunately I, I just wanted to perform Shakespeare <laughs> that was it and um, I still to this day my favorite feeling is when you go to the theater and you sit in the audience and it's the lights are up and it's noisy and people are chattering and you know arranging their seats and then all of a sudden there's the ding 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 and then the lights go down and everybody rustles and gets still. And there's that moment just before the curtains go up when it's like everybody draws collective breath waiting to, to go somewhere together. Ah, oh, that is magic. You're a writer, but you're more a storyteller. That is your gift. You, you, you can tell a wonderful story and it's fun to listen to you. Oh, th thank you so much. I, I hope so. That is that is what I, I want, is that that joy of telling a story yeah connecting you sold some a few books <laughs> sometimes you have to pinch yourself it's, it's a dream you have a family and how do you stay centered sometimes how do you stay centered what do you do to stay centered well maybe i i think you mention it there with my family uh, i have three sons and of course my husband too but three sons who range in age from 12 and a half down to two so it's uh, i thought that was a good idea to have a, a teenager and a toddler at the same time and then an eight-year-old in the middle but um, they're they're wonderful and it would be very difficult not to be grounded I think, when you have three little boy whirlwinds uh, in the house with you. Must have been not so easy. You came from Australia to London. For you, it's a dream. And for the rest of your family, and you, were, you are very lucky that it worked out. Yes, very. And it, there was um, 
trepidation before doing it, of course. And because no matter how many times people say things like, oh, kids are adaptable, they'll have a great time, it's wonderful to travel, you still, of course, they're your children and, and you you know, feel a lot of pressure, of course, not to disrupt them and for them to be happy. And I feel very uh, fortunate that um, as a family, we have landed on our feet. Ideas. As a writer, you need ideas. And is it a place, is it a situation or is it something where the best ideas come to you? And are you running around with your iPhone or with a computer or with a pen and paper to write it down? What is it for you? With a notebook. I'll show you if you like. I have one here. Yeah. Always scribbling. <laughs> <laughs> the next book. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I can't bear not to have it with me. And if I don't, it's the back of envelopes, napkins, menus, anything I can find. For me, there's a connection between, it's like it goes brain, arm, hand, finger, pen. And when I'm writing, I can focus my thoughts more than if I just tried to sit and daydream. Because I think without that physical connection to the the paper, my mind wanders, whereas that forces me. I even write questions to myself. Maybe she'd do this. No, she wouldn't do that. <laughs> did that develop? Or when you first wrote, wrote your first book, did you do it this way? Or did this way of running around with a notebook, did that develop? No, I've always done that. And I, I take far more notes than I ever use. I, I mean, I end up with 10, 11, 12 notebooks for every book and I every so often I'll go back and comb through looking for anything I, I want to use but have forgotten to include but most 90% of what I write down I never end up using but it's there's something very comforting about having trapped it on the page just in case. Yeah. Something completely different uh, you came from Australia you live in, in London now and Your favorite dish? What do you love to eat? Oh, if the first word that came into my mind was Italian food, so <laughs> I'm going to go with that. <laughs> I, mean, I think that might be everybody's favorite food: you know, garlic and basil and pasta and cheese and red wine. Oh, perfect. Being able or being allowed to write, yes, and to make a living out of it, it's a gift and. How did it change your life? What did it, did that do for you? I think an, an awful lot. We're sitting you're here because of that. Yeah. But how did it change you? It's not only you, your, the, your family's lives as well. Mm. That's why you moved to London, because of the success. Yes, you mean, so you mean more publishing rather than writing. Yeah, it, it, um, it's given me that freedom i suppose i mean moving to england for a time is something i'd always wanted to do and probably would have found a way to do anyway <laughs> because I, i should say uh, what i write and what i do is so much an extension of who i am that i think i would have found uh, a happiness and a way to use those things um anyway i mean if i were a librarian or worked in a bookstore or in publishing in any way or academia or, or it, Anything that involved reading and and jotting down ideas and and learning about history, there are many things that uh, fascinate me, and I am very fortunate because I'm able to fold them all in together into this uh, profession, uh, you know, of being a writer. But I I still would have indulged in them and found a way, I think, to use them um, if that hadn't worked out. Are you more the planning type? Is everything planned, and you know? I want to write this book, I have this note, I want to go there. Or I'm more spontaneous sometimes. Sure, you are, if you're a hard worker, it's, it's work. And you have to have a plan, a master plan somewhere. I'm both. And I, I, I used to be very much uh, reliant on my planning. And I'm slightly less so now. But before I even open the file on my computer and type chapter one, I spend about three, four, five months uh, simply notebooking and planning and uh, planning it sounds very structured and for me it's more um it's it's less structured than that it's um so i'm like a collector of ideas and i keep them all in the um 
cast, you know, the sort of basket up in my mind. And they can come from anywhere. And when it comes time to think of a new story, it's like tipping out all these pieces of jigsaw puzzle and just looking for some that go together. And when I've got two or three that belong, I know I've got a large enough kernel around which to do the, you know, to, to form the rest of the story. And that's when I start reading and some information I go looking for, others it's like an antenna is up and it, it, it comes when it's, when it's needed or it, it, I notice it because I need it. And then as that's happening, I get a sense of the uh, length and the shape and the characters and the setting and every so often a glimmer of a scene that won't happen for, I won't write for months, comes into my mind and a quick exchange of dialogue. And at, at a certain point, it gets to the stage where it's formed enough that I feel a compulsion to start writing it. And that's when I know I have to start. For you, is there something concerning this book where you say, oh, I'm so happy or I'm so proud that, that it worked out? Is there something? That's a really good question. I was just thinking about that myself uh, today, the way at the end of each book you, you do feel uh, there are certain things that, that um, work better or that you know I feel proud of. And that by the same token, there are things that I feel I, I didn't do quite as well as I wanted to and I had, have to move on to the next one and do it better. But I hope in, um, for me, it's, I'm always trying to improve characterization because I believe so strongly that um, character is fate uh, in, in, in terms of fiction. And everything that happens should be able to be traced back so that we can see why it happened to that person and, and how who they are determined the way they reacted to certain things which therefore led to um, you know, the, the end point of the book. So that's, I'm always trying to do better with characterization to sort of plumb the depths of my own knowledge of, of people and what makes them behave the way they do. You love to think. You love to think about people, about yourself, to analyze a lot. Yes. Is that true? <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm always being told, stop overthinking. Just stop overthinking things. <laughs> Not in a writing context, just in life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> is there a character you love? Every book is special, and I think for the moment you love this book. But is there a character you fell in love with in your books? In everything you wrote so far, is there someone? Oh, that's a really great question. And you're right, there's always the book that you've just finished or are just about to begin is always the one. So the one that comes to mind for Das Seahaus is uh, Eleanor, who surprised me. And that doesn't happen often because I do a lot of planning and thinking before I start. But she was always supposed to have an important role, but a small part. And... I know the moment she turned into a much larger character who took up a lot of space in the book and it was when I decided I needed to show a, a scene in her childhood and the moment I started doing that she came to life for me in such a vivid way that she um, ended up taking up a lot more space in the book than she was going to and now when I say that to people who've read it she's she's people's favorite character they can't believe she was ever not going to be you know play this large part writing is your job yes and how do you do it where are you sitting you have an office or a typewriter what are you yeah how are you writing well in in Australia I have an, an office And it's, it's really lovely. Uh, in London, uh, my husband, who's a musician and he writes music for uh, soundtracks for documentaries, we have a, a l tiny spare room in the house and he has a desk at one end and I have a tiny desk, which is more <laughs> like a, a windowsill at the other end of the room. And we work at the same time. Uh, so we send our first two our big boys off to school and our little fellow is, is still with us so we we'll, you know, maybe get a coffee and take him out for a wander and then uh, go home and he has a sleep and we go to our opposite sides of the room and, and start working. But uh, I mean having said that I'm never really not working. It's, it's all you know it's, it's one of those jobs that you can't help but take with you because but partly because I love it and also because in order to commit to a project that's so large and takes so much time and, and has so much of me in it, um, it lives inside my brain like a second layer of life in a way. And everything, feed, it feeds into my life and my life feeds into it.
great. Thank you very much. Thank you so it much. It was a pleasure meeting you. And there's so many questions. I just wanted to start. And <laughs> I know. It was, it was very you know, great to speak with you. I like your questions. Thank you.